Now, a quote that I saw from you earlier, and I wanted to get your uh, sort of an expansion on, was decentralization is not the goal, it's simply the tool. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Yeah, I do say that, and I think it's true. So many people get fixated on decentralization for decentralization's sake, and we're going to decentralize everything. Like, no, decentralization is just the tool to achieve censorship resistance, where people ha can have control over their own money, and you don't need an infinite amount of censors of decentralization in order to achieve that. You just need enough. Just like if uh, you want to store a thousand dollars in a safe, you don't need a safe that takes a million dollars worth of effort to open it. You just need a safe that takes a little bit more than a thousand dollars worth of effort to open it, and it's good enough. Fair enough. So if financial emancipation, potentially one of the goals there. That's definitely one of the goals. Okay. And now looking around the world, what do you think? I mean, we saw a presentation by you earlier and you, you showed that, well, places where they're more financially free, much more prosperous, et cetera, et cetera. Bitcoin Cash, we're going to be able to help a little bit of an injection of freedom, you reckon, into some of these other economies? That's the whole goal with my entire involvement in cryptocurrency is to build the financial tools to enable people to have complete control of their own money and be able to do what they want with their own money because that's what makes the world a better place. And this sort of altruism, this altruistic mindset, where does that come from? That's just a fire burning inside you or how do you, how do you work so with it's, that? So it, it's not altruism. So like there's, I have to live in the world too mm -hmm. and I want to live in the most amazing best world I possibly can. So it's not altruism, it's, it's looking out for my own self-interest that I want to live in this amazing world with flying cars and all sorts of amazing stuff. And we can achieve all that through a faster rate of economic growth and more cryptocurrency adoption around the world leads to more economic growth. And that leads to, you know, better flat screen TVs and, you know, SpaceX stuff going into space and all this amazing stuff that we all read about as kids in science fiction books. Well, let's make all those things a reality sooner rather than later. And cryptocurrencies are a fantastic tool to help speed up that uh, pace of uh, innovation. For sure. And cryptocurrencies, um, I guess my question would be, we talk about censorship resistance in the financial realm, and that's the cryptocurrency angle. What do you think um, these days with some other arenas, let's say social media or some of these big tech guys, what do you think about censorship in these areas? And is there something that a DLT solution might be able to do to address it? We're starting to see the first generation social media platforms that are on blockchains that can't be censored. And we're seeing the old legacy social media platforms like Facebooks and the Twitters and the YouTubes censoring more and more content and taking more and more videos and tweets and posts offline. And from my point of view, the best solution to bad information is more true information. And uh, I don't think we need these gatekeepers deciding what who's allowed to say what about what. And so memo.cash is a fun example of a kind of a version of Twitter, but it's all on the Bitcoin Cash blockchain and nobody can delete your tweet. Whereas, uh, you know, I'm wondering... When, when is Jack going to delete my Twitter account if yeah. I say something? And so here's an interesting example of that. So in the terms of service on Twitter, it says you're not allowed to, you know, make threats of violence. And like, sure. that's pretty good. But there's this big giant exception right there in the terms of service. You're allowed to like, you're not allowed to advocate for violence, it says. But you're allowed to advocate for violence if it's the government doing the violence. So you can say, oh, the army needs to invade this country and kill a bunch of people over there. That's fine to say on Twitter. But if I say, you know, Owen should go and kill those people over there, right. that's not okay. But why the double standard? You put on a costume and call yourself, you know, a military man and then it's okay to murder people? No, it's just a costume and like they're no more human than you or I. So if it's wrong for you and I to go somewhere else and kill people, it's wrong for people in the military to go somewhere else and kill people because a bunch of politicians told them to. That's a bunch of nonsense too. Yeah. But you can't say a lot of that sort of thing on social media or though. One of my favorite accounts on Twitter was an account called Anarchy Ball it was pointing out these same sort of things like government people are just people too. Got, they got their account deleted, and I used to love following that account. And my, my current favorite account on Twitter, though, is a Sal the Agorist. I don't know if you've seen this account on Twitter. I haven't, no. But it's filled with awesome memes, like spreading the ideas of voluntarism and right. self-ownership. And I love the Twitter account, but I wonder, like, when, when are they going to ban him from Twitter, too? Right. And maybe I'll be next for being banned. So. Could be. Most hated man in crypto. Some are saying that could be you or John McAfee. It's kind of a... Maybe it's the propagandists that uh, have the most to lose from cryptocurrency being adopted around the world that are attacking people like me and John McAfee for trying to spread crypto adoption. It could be. And I guess so the social media censorship, I mean, do you think we'll see a real migration away from some of these major platforms? We saw, I guess, PewDiePie already doing some exclusive streaming on a, on a blockchain platform. We can hope, but network effects are really, really sticky. So the user experience on MySpace had to get really, really, really bad before people jumped ship to, to Facebook. Right. And the censorship would have to get really, really, really bad 
on these other platforms before people would jump ship. But this sneaky thing about censorship is when they do it properly, people don't even know that the censorship's going on and most people are oblivious to it. And so I hope people will jump to a censorship resistant platform and I'll encourage people to jump to a censorship resistant platform, but will the masses actually do that? Like most people aren't even aware. I mean, look at how many people think Julian Assange or Edward Snowden are bad guys that like right. some of the people are calling for them to be executed. Like this is madness. These are people that are telling the people who paid the NSA and paid the government to do these yeah. things. You're just being informed of what your tax dollars are being used on. And then people are mad at these people for informing you what your own tax dollars are being used on. Like, yeah. wow, propaganda works, censorship works. It's a really a big problem. And I wish I had a, an easy solution to it. I, I don't know what the solution is, but uh, I guess more more information and more content like this. So. <laughs> Let's hope so. Now we did touch on John McAfee quickly. What do you think of his presidential run, an incognito, what is he, clone-based presidential run or something like that? Huh? I don't know, it sure is exciting. And I think we need more people to, I just kind of just point out how ridiculous the whole system is and how rigged the whole system is. And another person that's running, uh, I guess technically he's running for not president of the United States is a man named Adam Kokesh. And he's running on the platform that if he's elected not president of the United States, he'll uh, organize an orderly dissolution of the United States federal government and return everything back to the state level and then uh, go from there. And I think that would be far, far, far better than what uh, we have happening in Washington, D.C. right now. And it wouldn't just be good for America. It would be good for the whole world because America's you know, military system is really good at causing trouble all over the place and intervening. And one, one last small rant, so like uh, all the people in America, they're all riled up. Oh, Russia interfered in the right. election in the United right. States. America interferes in Wait. just about every election Wait in every country around the world. <laughs> There's military bases all over the place. They're busy interfering in every election. So like, why the double standard? They're furious if Russia allegedly bought some ads on Facebook to right. interfere in the election, right. but right. America's interfering in every election everywhere. So yeah. just more, you know, double thought or double, double speak uh, on the internet. Absolutely. And I guess if we do see one of these big paradigm shift changes, if the not president becomes the, the not leader in chief, would that uh, motivate you to sort of reapply for American citizenship or you're sort of off that train? In my ideal world, there's no such thing as, as citizenship. So I think each individual owns themselves and you can contract with a private ID company to issue IDs and keep track of that sort of thing. But the whole idea that like you were born on this piece of land and to go to that piece of land on this giant rock that's flying around in space. And if you don't have the right color piece of paper from the people wearing the right costume, you're not allowed to go there like the whole thing is just nuts to me right so you mentioned here a private id service can you go a little bit more in depth there that's an interesting notion so i guess one example like uh, i was on a, a cryptocurrency trading platform peer-to-peer -peer one and i said like i'm roger veer i want to do this trade and like yeah sure you're roger veer yeah right, right, and, right. And, and you know george bush is my uncle or whatever and he's <laughs> and i said well I, I can prove it to you and he said well i said what's your i asked him what's your twitter id right and then he told me his Twitter ID and I sent him a direct message from my Twitter account to his Twitter ID. And then he thought, oh, wow, it really is Roger Veer or Roger Veer has had his Twitter account hacked, one of the two. Mm -hmm. And it's so like even Twitter, like if you're dealing with the same person over and over, that's an example of, it's not perfect, but it's, it's certainly a pretty decent way of being able to prove your identity and who you're dealing with and that sort of thing. And I don't see why you couldn't have other companies doing the exact same sort of thing where you have identity services related to private businesses and you don't have some sort of you know, permission-based thing from some central uh, authority. And why not toss that all on the blockchain as well? Totally. So permissioned and centralized authority that leads us directly to what do you think of sort of the, the International Monetary Fund, World Bank experimenting with some crypto uh, crypto offerings there, or even, I guess, one step below, Facebook looking, Libra Networks looking to do uh, their own cryptocurrency. What do you think of that? Yeah, if, if they can't beat you, then they join you. And I think we're uh, reaching that stage at this point. So uh, I think we're going to see a, an additional just tidal wave of adoption of cryptocurrencies. And we don't know exactly what the the structure of like the Facebook coin that's coming will be, but my guess is it won't be nearly as permissionless or as wonderful as things like Bitcoin Cash or these other actual cryptocurrencies in which people are in complete control and they'll have to compete on the market and whichever coin is the most useful, I think the most people will use. That makes a lot of sense. Now you've been, of course, vocally critical of Bitcoin Core, as you call it, and well, not only their fee structure, but also sort of a change in philosophy, I guess, moving away from this peer-to-peer -peer cash that was such a, a central component. I guess the question about Bitcoin Cash is, is there some sort of guarantee that uh, we won't see something similar, a fee increase as well as, you know, once adoption pumps up? It seems really unlikely because of the philosophy and the ethos of the people that are involved. And we already had this fight once and the people that wanted high fees and full blocks, they have their BTC version of Bitcoin. And the people that want peer-to-peer -peer cash for the world have our BCH version of Bitcoin. And uh, I let you know, let people use whichever one they like the most. So I, I think it's unlikely for, for the fees 
to have the same sort of problem on Bitcoin Cash, but you never know what the future will bring, right? That's that's the thing about the future is it's hard to predict. Yeah, absolutely. Hey, well, here we are in Lugano, Switzerland, and Switzerland and blockchain are sort of a match made in heaven. The, the citizenry is very used to direct democracy. There's a lot of decentralization. What have you seen so far in the, the situation here in Switzerland? So I, I met with the mayor of Lugano yesterday and explained Bitcoin Cash to them, and they were very excited about it. I met uh, with some members of German uh, parliament uh, earlier today, so I'm setting everybody up with Bitcoin Cash wallets and showing them how it works. And remember, the ticker symbol for Bitcoin Cash is BCH. Mm -hmm. The two-letter uh, symbol for Switzerland totally. is CH. Hey, so Bitcoin Switzerland, that. right? BCH. Yeah, so yeah. I think we're going to see more and more Bitcoin Cash adoption here in Switzerland. Okay, perfect. Now, just keep you for another two minutes here. I just wanted to do something fun. A quick word association. If I spit at you a couple words, a phrase, or maybe a name, if you could just give me the first thing that pops in your head. All right, okay. here we go. Voluntarism. The way the world should work. Love it. Freetalklive.com. The place I heard about Bitcoin in the first place. There we go. John McAfee. <laughs> really fun guy. <laughs> Have you been following his, uh, he does these sort of daily like drink recipe things. Have you ever seen that? Else? I've seen some of those, yeah. Yeah, that's funny. Okay. American citizenship. Imaginary. Tone vase. Ignorant. Tone loke. I don't know who that is. Funky cold Medina. Oh, the song. Oh, I thought it was Tone Lock, but it's Tone, tone Lock. Maybe I don't lock. know. So uh, From the Bay Area, I guess. Yeah, you're, you're uh, know better than me. A song from when I was very young. Yeah. Okay, and I heard Tone Vase. That's who he's named after, actually. So his real name isn't Tone. And okay. His last name isn't Vase. Oh, okay. So, yeah. Well, there you go. His name's Tony, and then some Russian last name is oh, Russian. Okay. So. Interesting. Keep it moving here. Maybe, Lieberland. Maybe he's a Russian oh, spy. Right? Russian so, spy. <laughs> he's the man. Lieberland. Uh, fantastic opportunity. Yeah, very cool. And finally, Murray Rothbard. My intellectual role model. Love it. We'll stop it there. Roger, thanks so much, man. Always Thank great you. to see you. Cheers. Thank you. Boom, 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 boom.